I'll just go live now and then you can start. Okay. Okay, so hi everybody. I I hope you you enjoyed our uh, first day of the workshop. Uh, so today we are starting uh, the second day. And uh, so as usual, uh, you can, um, as it was done yesterday, you can post uh, your question on ask.eguin.org. So maybe let's see if I can post in the chat the link where you can uh, write the questions. Let me do it. Okay, should be this one. And then um, we have uh, two, yesterday we spoke about the, the detectors and which are the available data. Today we will speak about uh, data quality and uh, about uh, the, um, the CB, the compact binary uh, searches. So our uh, first uh, uh, speaker um, that will uh, tell us about data quality is um, uh, Ronaldo uh, Macas, who is um, a member of the LIGO uh, collaboration. He's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Portsmouth, and he is specializing in understanding the mitigation of noise for gravitational wave uh, detector. So I hope I pronounced your name um, correctly. And uh, Enjoy. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. Okay. Are you able to see my slides? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So let's start. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Again, uh, today I will be talking about uh, data quality in gravitational wave detectors. Uh, I will start from acknowledgements. So in order to pre prepare these slides, I was using quite a lot of material material from the previous years, just because many things have not changed, some things have changed. So this was really like a team effort. Uh, if you want to have a look at these previous year slides, you can actually have a look at uh, this link and you will see the previous year slides. Uh, so today I will be talking about uh, some short introduction about the strain data. So what is the strain data? Uh, what is uh, how does it look like in time domain, in frequency domain, also in time and frequency domain? Uh, then I will be talking more about uh, data quality itself. So, uh, what are noise artifacts? Uh, what tools we use to inspect the data quality in gravitational wave detectors? And then I will give a brief summary of data quality in O3 and what we ex can expect from uh, the next observing round, observing round four. And then in turn, I will give uh, quite important references. So firstly, let's start from the basics. Uh, what is the strain data H of T? So gravitational wave strain data is really just the relative difference between LX and LY arms, uh, which is given right here with this equation. Uh, yeah, right, right here with this equation. And what it actually means, so here is a very simplified di diagram uh, of the detector. You basically have laser, you have X and Y arms, and when a gravitational wave passes through, is going to change the length in the space time. And because of that, uh, these uh, arms are going to change in distance as well, in length as well. And that is basically just a simple one dimensional quantity, H of T. So, to some extent, uh, you could say that it is a very simple uh, quantity, H of T, it is just one dimensional quantity. Uh, for example, astronomical data sets are like uh, images uh, most of the time. So, they have like two dimensions. So, maybe this is like simple uh, uh, gravitational wave data, H of T. But well, you can see from this image, so this is raw time series data. It looks uh, quite complicated, at least in my opinion. So you can see that there's, for example, some uh, low frequency stuff happening, like a breathing mode. There's a lot of high frequency wiggles happening. Uh, and you're not really sure, uh, looking at this data, is there something important happening with this data? Is there like a glitch if there's a signal? So you're not really sure just by looking at the raw time series data. Uh, so this H of T, uh, is sampled at LIGO detectors with 16 kilohertz. So that means that for one second, we have about 16,000 uh, samples. And then for the open data that you, you can get on QOSC is 16 kilohertz or 4 kilohertz data. And as I said previously, it kind of looks quite complicated. But then uh, we will do some data analysis tools to see that it can actually be much simplified. Uh, so then we have frequency uh, representation of the same time series data. 
So let's take, for example, 512 seconds of the time series data. Uh, and then you divide that 512 seconds into shorter chunk, chunks. So for example, four seconds. And then you take these uh, four second chunks and then you just do the FFT. So you take a Fourier, Fourier transform of these uh, segments. And then you basically take the median Fourier transform of these uh, segments. Uh, and then this is the plot that you actually get uh, with some additional modifications, but this is the idea. So this is uh, showing you the sensitivity. Uh, so that median Fourier transform is actually the median detector sensitivity. And this is how the detector sensitivity looks like. So contrary to like many uh, like intuitive sense, uh, you would think that the higher number is better, but actually in gravitational wave data, the lower number is better. So this is uh, on y-axis, this is uh, gravitational wave amplitude spectral density. I will talk about that in the next slide. But basically, this shows you how much you're able to uh, measure, how small difference in the length you're able to measure. So you want to uh, be able to measure as small differences as possible. And that's why you want to have your sensitivity to go to be as low as possible. Uh, and that's uh, looking at this, uh, at this image. You can see that actual gravitational wave detectors are the most sensitive at around like 100 to 200 hertz. Then it is really bad uh, sensitivity at lower uh, frequencies just because of the ground motion mostly. Uh, so you're not very sensitive at those frequencies. And then at higher frequencies, you also get like uh, quantum effects uh, happening. Uh, and because of that, you're not very sensitive at higher frequencies as well. It doesn't mean that, mean that you cannot extract any information from the detector. It just means that you basically uh, need to be careful at, for example, any low frequency information because uh, you see that the detector is very noisy at low frequencies. Uh, so uh, in order to like make more sense of the raw time series data, we actually do the whitening time series. Uh, so what does it mean? So first, as I said on the last slide, uh, transforming strain data to frequency domain allows us to estimate the average detector sensitivity for each frequency. Band. So we can say that for that particular frequency, we're that sensitive. And this is so called amplitude spectral density. And having ASD uh, allows us to whiten the data. Uh, this is a jargon in uh, data analysis. It is basically meaning the scaling the data. Uh, so for example, uh, detector is less, less sensitive at lower frequencies because of uh, the previous plot that I showed you, and that happens because of the ground motion. So basically that means that any information at low frequencies should be to some extent less important than at medium frequencies. And this is just because uh, if you detect something at low frequencies that is like a very strong signal, you need to keep in mind that there's a lot of noise happening at low frequency, and that noise is also like quite loud. So that's why you should be to some extent scaling the data. Uh, and this is how it looks like. So you have this raw time series data, and then you just divide by ASD. Like you use Fourier transform to do that like in frequency domain, but basically this is the result that you get. So after you take this one second of the data, so looking at this one second of the data, raw, raw time series data, you cannot really see anything suspicious. There's maybe like some strange wiggle right here, but you're not really sure what is happening. Uh, is it important? Is it not important? Uh, yeah, so what you do, you basically divide by ASD. You divide, you basically uh, take the, you basically scale the data, and that allows us to get like this plot down uh, that you can see right here. And here you can clearly see that there's a huge uh, excess power happening at like around the middle plot time. Something is happening just uh, in like the first uh, 0 0.1 seconds of this plot. And in this plot, you can see, see much clearer that there's actually a huge signal. This is actually not a signal, but a gravitational wave uh, noise, because signals are not really that loud in gravitational wave data. Uh, but yes, you will not be able to see that from the data right here. So this is the frequency. This is basically the scaling the data. And then gravitational scientists also like to look at the images. Uh, and for that, we are using Q transforms. Uh, there's a Q transform. It is also called Q scan, Q series, spectrogram, Omega scan. So are multiple names, basically meaning the same thing that we want to look at the plots uh, of uh, frequency evolution over time. And there are just like a small differences, like a normalization or something like that. Uh, what is a Q transform. So firstly, you select a Q value, and Q value is defined by this equation, which basically means that you select a frequency, central frequency, and then you divide by bandwidth. Uh, so this is a representation of how the Q uh, tiles look. So for example, if you have a low Q value, for example, eight, uh, then you're uh, good at uh, short duration signals uh, that have 
a huge bandwidth or if you for example have high q value for example 100 then you have a uh, long duration uh, then uh, this type of a tile is very good for uh, long duration signals like binary neutral source signals for example from yesterday's tutorials uh, you were using i think so 110 q value to plot uh, q scans for the uh, for the bns signal that is because the bns signal the B, uh, the in spiral part is very long and that's why you want to use like this type of tile rather than like this type of tile uh, so yes, so you basically select a key value, you select the tile essentially that you want to tile your time frequency data, then you find the most optimal value and that is really subjective, so uh, it really depends whether you're looking at short duration signals, that long duration signals and so on, and then you basically make a Q transform plot for this particular Q value, and this is how a plot like this would look like, so you can see that it allows us to see the frequency evolution of the signal over time, and that is very important because like all of the gravitational signals basically have some sort of frequency evolution over time and it is it is much easier to look at this type of plot than at frequency domain or like time series domain so this is very important part that we are using quite a lot in data analysis and in data quality as well uh now let's have a look uh, at the data quality so uh gravitational wave noise uh contrary to many searches but Thing. So in many searches, there's this assumption that uh, gravitational wave data is, non uh, is Gaussian and stationary. But actually, uh, in my type of work, when I'm working with gravitational wave data noise, uh, I can see that the data is actually non-Gaussian and non-stationary. So that means that there's a lot of noise that is changing over time. There's a lot of noise that is actually like very loud, and it is uh, sometimes even similar to gravitational wave signals. And these uh, noise, uh, uh, that noise we are calling glitches, and here on the right hand side, you can see different type of glitches. So you can see there's like a huge range of glitches. There's like actually many more type of glitches than what you can see here. But you can see that, for example, we have like short duration, uh, high bandwidth glitches, which are actually called blips. Uh, then you have like uh, long duration uh, and uh, well, uh, small frequency bandwidth signals right here. Or for example, like read the messy glitches like that one. So there's literally like a huge range of glitches uh, in gravitational wave data. And why should we even care about those glitches? Well, firstly, uh, they affect gravitational wave detector sensitivity. So, for example, if you have a glitch like this, uh, you can actually see or try to detect anything, and that really affects the gravitational wave detector sensitivity. It also affects gravitational wave searches. So, for example, this sort of a glitch, which is so-called blip glitch, it is very similar. It looks very similar to a, a gravitational wave signal, a binary black hole signal that is uh, very massive. And because it's a very massive DBH uh, binary black hole signal, it is going to be very short signal and high frequency bandwidth, uh, which basically is looking very similar to this glitch. So that's why gravitational wave searches uh, get confused when they see the sort of a glitch and they think that maybe this is actually a signal. So they can affect gravitational wave searches. And also these sort of like uh, glitches can also affect the parameter estimation. So for example, scale localization, if you're trying to send uh, astronomers uh, the scalpelization of a, of a gravitational wave event, you want to have the scalpelization as precise as possible. But if there are glitches nearby, some glitches like that, next to a signal, it can affect the scalpelization of the uh, gravitational wave signal. So that is quite important, not only from uh, our gravitational wave uh, perspective, but also from for other astronomers as well. Uh, so how do we detect the glitches? Uh, it is quite easy to detect glitches just basically because uh, what is a glitch? Essentially, it is basically a glitch is something that is non-Gaussian. And this is what is uh, basically used uh, in this tool, Omicron tool. And it is uh, we have been using that for years. And here on the right-hand side, you can see a plot of uh, for one day. And basically, these all small, small dots are basically glitches at different frequencies. So you can see, for example, that there's a lot of glitches happening at uh, 40 hertz for that particular day. Then something was happening at this particular hour, about like eight hours UTC time uh, for this particular date. So this is from the third observing run. And then you can see that, for example, there's a lot of glitches just like before the for the lock loss at around like 20 hours. And this is actually scattering glitches. These are like low frequency, uh, many glitches. And then there's like a lot of uh, not very noisy, but a lot of glitches at high frequency, but we shouldn't really care about them because like, as you remember, the sensitivity is not very good at those frequencies. And these glitches are not really that strong. 
but you can see that there's like a lot of glitches uh, that are happening during the day. So there's really like thousands of glitches that we record every day. Uh, and then uh, another important and interesting thing is that uh, glitch rate varies over time. So this is the plot showing you how uh, the glitch rate uh, changed over time. Uh, so for example, for LIGO Hanford detector, uh, you can see that this is like in the second observing run, the glitch rate, rate was something about 0.1 glitches per one minute. Uh, but then, oh yeah, so it doesn't actually tell the exact, or oh yeah, glitch rate per minute. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so about 0.1 glitches per minute. And then you can see that in the third observing run, it actually increased uh, the rate of glitches. And then also you can see at the x-axis, so this is time uh, days from April. So this is uh, for the third observing run. It actually changes over like, you know, months of time, for example. So sometimes, like, for example, LIGO Hanford is sensitive to like uh, ocean waves or like winter times uh, because of the seismic noise. And because of that, it can have like some noise right here. So yeah, so there's like a lot of factors uh, causing these glitches, but it changes over time. And then it changes uh, for each observing run, as you can see. So for LIGO detectors, you can see that the glitch rate actually increased quite substantially by factors of like three to five uh, from second observing run to third observing run. Uh, but then for Virgo, we can see that it actually decreased quite significantly. And this is because uh, uh, Virgo detector made uh, some uh, important improvements uh, in, in the, uh, how they are hanging their mirrors. And because of that, they are, were able to reduce the glitch rate quite significantly. For LIGO, for LIGO detectors, that was done previously, so they didn't have that issue in the in the second or third observing room. Uh, so yeah, so it is important to keep in mind that glitch rate varies over time. It uh, changes from the uh, from each of the observing run, and it also changes uh, for each day essentially. And uh, what is the origin of these glitches? So we know some origin of some glitches. Uh, we cannot really know uh, some origin of other glitches. So for example, there's uh, some glitches that are caused by natural things, for example, like thunderstorms. And here on the top, you can see an image of a scat of the of the thunderstorm glitch. You can see that this is basically just a wide band glitch uh, happening over a period of like a thunderstorm, essentially. Uh, and then there's actually some human made. So for example, there are trains uh, that are happening that are driving past a living sun detector uh, in Louisiana. And that is causing like some glitches and that is causing some problems, of course. Uh, or for example, like really like very uh, funny ones, like for example, a fridge uh, connected to the main power and it can cause like, uh, some glitches as well. Uh, so we have like natural and human made glitches. Uh, and then some glitches are actually recorded by witness channels. So for example, we, I will talk about that later, but we also have like uh, a lot of sensors uh, around our detectors that are trying to record a lot of things. And maybe we are able to basically find the origin of the glitches. So we know that some glitches are recorded by our sensors and we know that what is causing them, but then we do not have uh, information about some other type of glitches. So for example, light scattering uh, glitches, uh, they, are, they are called light scattering glitches because well, we know uh, what is causing them. It is caused by light bouncing from the, uh, in the beam. Uh, and we found that by looking at the uh, witness channels but for example, blip glitches uh, that I'll show you later, uh, we do not really know what is causing these glitches. So uh, yeah, uh, it is not really clear cut thing for glitches. For some glitches, we know what is happening. For some other glitches, we do not really know what is happening. A uh, good thing about uh, some of these glitches, when we are able to identify what is happening, what is causing these glitches, we are able to mitigate uh, these uh, glitches. And this plot is actually shows quite well what was done in the third observing run for LIGO detectors. So uh, we basically impl implemented RC tracking, which is basically uh, used to reduce these type of glitches. And this is basically the plot showing the SNR of these glitches before uh, the RC tracking implemented, and then after the RC tracking was implemented with the uh, red line. So, and this is SNR on x-axis and number of triggers on y-axis. So you can see that basically after implementing RC tracking, we were able to reduce the SNR of glitches and also to reduce the number of triggers. So that was basically uh, helping quite a lot. Uh, what tools do we use to inspect uh, the data to try to find the glitches and try to mitigate those glitches? So firstly, uh, we basically following this sort of procedure. So we want to get rid of, uh, we want to get rid of glitches, but how? So firstly, we need to identify the loss. 
Uh, then we need to look for potential correlations with the witness channels that I'm going to talk about that later. Uh, then we need to perform uh, multiple tests to simulate that noise to make sure that this is actually causing the noise. Then we are trying to fix the noise source, or if we cannot fix the noise source, we can try to reduce it or maybe uh, mitigate it. And then if you are not able to uh, eliminate the noise source or we cannot like mitigate that noise source, you can try to model the noise or create needles. And for these, all of these steps, we are using multiple tools. So uh, in our uh, analysis, we are using Omicron Q-Transform. So I talked about these tools and then I'm going to talk about Gravity Spy, Gravity Spy HV2 and a couple of other things. And basically, uh, these first tools we are using for identifying the noise. So Omicron crew transform and Gravity Spy is used for identifying the noise. And then HV2 is used for uh, looking at potential, uh, potential uh, correlations with the witness channels. So let's talk about Gravity Spy because I haven't talked about that. So Gravity Spy is actually quite an interesting tool. So this is uh, an image recognition algorithm uh, based on uh, machine learning. And it is able to classify uh, transit noise, so it is able to classify these type of glitches in 23 classes. It is not actually naming those glitches, it is just giving the classes, and then we humans uh, tend to name things, so that's why we are calling these glitches uh, as they are shown right here. And basically this algorithm is trained on the time frequency spectrograms of the noise transients, so really just like these Q transforms. And then for the input, we are using Omicron triggers, and then for the output, we are saying that please uh, uh, classify these glitches in like 23 classes, for example. And here you can see that basically it is able to classify these type of different glitches, and then humans just name them. So this is how a blip glitch looks like. So this is, as I said, like very short duration and high frequency bandwidth uh, glitch. And this really represents uh, like a, a high mass uh, binary black hole event. Then Tom T glitch is basically something very similar to a blip glitch, like it is relatively short but a bit uh, longer in duration and then uh, relatively high bandwidth. And then, yeah, like we have different type of like scattering, fast scattering and slow scattering. And this is called by flat bouncing from the, from the beams in the, in the gravitational wave detector. And then there's like some whistles and fish and so on. So yeah, so basically this tool is very useful. And actually, uh, yeah, you can have a look at this publication, but this is so-called uh, like public uh, citizen science project. So even you, or as a volunteer, you can actually go uh, to Gravity Spy database and try to help to decide which glitch is uh, which belongs to which category, and you can try to uh, improve the data quality yourself. So I would definitely recommend to go and have a look at Gravity Spy and uh, see if you would like to contribute. And then you have witness channels. So uh, gra gravitational wave detectors have thousands of sensors that record various activity, and if you remember the first image that I showed a very simple image of the detector. This is a bit more complicated image. Uh, this is still like very simplified image, like there's like way more things happening, but this is a bit more complicated image, but still very simple. And I'm not going to talk about about this uh, so about this diagram in, in detail, but essentially the idea is that here is the laser, here's the beam splitter, here are the mirrors in the X arm and Y arm, and here's the, uh, the uh, here's the detector, photo detector. And there's a lot of things happening. And basically, we have like each of these, like for example, each each mirror is suspended on like four uh, four uh, different suspensions. In each of these four different suspensions have like basically dozens of uh, sensors that are sensing how these mirrors are tilted, what is the acceleration in these uh, mirrors, and so on. So basically, we have a lot of sensors. In the detector, we have like a lot of sensors outside of the detector that is able to tell us what is happening in the detector and outside of the detector. And these are so-called witness channels. Why that is useful? Well, it is useful because uh, we can use those witness channels uh, uh, with hierarchical veto, which is so-called HV2. So what we do, we basically just take statistical correlations between noise and gravitation with strain channels, so HFT. And then we select, uh, we look for statistical correlations with these witness channels. And this is basically the table that we get uh, with this uh, HV tool. So, for example, uh, in this particular day, we found that this particular channel was uh, statistically correlating with uh, the strain data the best. And this is so called like L1. So, this is like Livingston uh, lens and sensing control channel, which is, uh, which is called like, like that, basically. And then if you go to the previous uh, documentation, the previous spot, this is actually, this is the channel right here. So LSE, Ruffle A. 
So you can actually go back to this diagram and see that basically this noise that was happening on that day was uh, statistically correlating mostly with the H of T, uh, which was basically happening at this part of the detector. So then people would go back to the detector and they would try to see what is happening with the detector at this particular site and try to see if we can basically mitigate the noise or maybe something is happening wrong with this part of the detector and that allows us to basically mitigate the noise. And yeah, so that allows us to find the potential noise culprits uh, and we can try to mitigate those noise sources, but that does not work all the time. It works quite often, but not all the time. Uh, just because some noise some sources are not recorded by any witness channels, like as I said, for blips, we still do not really have a good uh, potential uh, channel uh, correlating with this with, with blips. And then with many other sources, we, uh, we are not actually able to like record that noise uh, uh, well enough. So this is h uh, So as I said, uh, quite often we cannot really find the root cause of the noise. And for that, we can try to use the mo uh, noise modeling to try to remove the noise. So when we can cannot like try to mitigate that, we can try to remove it. Uh, we can try to model and then remove it. For example, here we can see one of the uh, gravitational wave signals from the last observing run. So here is a binary black hole signal. And then there was some noise happening after the after the signal, and actually there was some noise happening at the signal as well. And we had one witness channel, uh, which is just called like a radio frequency 45, essentially. That is just like one uh, single witness channel. Uh, and uh, this is basically the plot at the same time axis as this plot. And you can see that we can see like a glitch uh, or like excess power right here. And this is what happening with H of T. You can see there's some excess power in this witness channel recorded and it is also happening right here and there was actually some noise happening at this particular time during exactly when the signal was uh, happening as well so during that astrophysical signal there was some noise recorded in the in the witness channel so we can actually try to uh, use linear noise subtraction to try to model this correlation and we can try to remove this uh, noise so for that we are using linear noise subtraction which was like developed a couple of years ago. And we can use this witness channel information to model the noise in H of T, the gravitational wave strain data, and then we can try to remove it. So this is the original data, just a shorter segment. So this is the surfactical signal, and this is the glitch. Then we can basically model the noise and remove it. And you can see, for example, that after cleaning the data, we do not really have the glitch right here anymore. So uh, it basically works quite well. And then you can see that basically there's the residual. So this is the data that was basically taken out. But unfortunately, we cannot do this quite often because most of the times we are we are not able to find uh, the auxiliary channel, the witness channel for this type of noise. So instead of that, we need to use base wave. Uh, and base wave, is, base wave is basically able to do some uh, fancy uh, modeling of the noise with some prior assumptions. But basically it is using like wavelets to model the noise or like maybe uh, model the signal as well. And for that, we are not using any witness channel information. So for that, like for example, here's the uh, examples. We have like a gravitational wave signal right here. There is some noise happening right here. And then we can actually use base wave to subtract the glitch. And this was what was subtracted. So we are able to remove some part of the noise. Not everything, but we are able to remove some part of the noise. And then uh, if nothing else really works, we can create uh, data quality vetoes. So that basically is saying that we cannot really find the uh, noise source. We cannot really model the noise itself. So what we can we can do instead, we can basically say that look, uh, don't don't use this data or like use this data uh, at that particular time and be very careful of that. And that's so called vetoes. So these uh, vetoes basically have different categories depending on the uh, seriousness of the issue. So the first category of vetoes are basically meaning that uh, there was a major issue with a key detector component and you should not use that data basically almost never. And then there's category two, which is uh, basically saying that there's no noise, uh, there's a known cause uh, noise coupling to gravitational wave strain H of T, for example, high ground motion. So you can try to use that data, but you should be careful. And if there's like a signal that you de detect, you should be basically looking at that third uh, to see if that is not caused by noise. And then category three is statistical noise coupling to H of T that is not really well understood. So basically we have like H veto. We see that there's like some noise that is coupling quite well to, H, to the gravitational wave strain, but we can actually see why that is happening and we don't actually understand why that's happening. Then in gravitational wave open data science center, you can find basically these flags for each of the observing run data. 
Uh, and then the last uh, link that I wanted to show you is basically daily detector status. And you can click on this link later when you get the sites. Uh, but this basically is a public page that is showing you the status of the detectors uh, for each uh, date when they were uh, operational. So for example, this is particular date for the BNS event for binary neutrosar event 170817. And for that particular date, you can see the sensitivity curves for this particular date. You can actually go and have a look at this uh, at this page for today, for example, detectors are not not all of them are turned on, but like you can see what is happening with the detectors at the moment. So you would be able to see the sort of a plot for like detectors if they are operational. Uh, then uh, you can also see basically operating segments uh, data. So for this particular data, uh, Hanford, Livingston, and very good detectors were working quite well. And the BNS event happened, I think, so at around this time at, at around one p.m. UTC. So all of the three detectors were operating, and GU, I think, so was not operating at that time. Uh, I'm not really sure. And uh, then uh, there's another important uh, plot, which is basically showing the binary neutrons are in spiral range, which is basically showing you the sensitivity of the uh, detectors. Uh, and at that particular date, uh, the Livingston detector was about 100 megaparsecs, uh, Hanford detector was about 50 megaparsecs, and Virgo detector was about 25 megaparsecs for that particular date. And then you can have a look for, for example, what is the sensitivity of detectors today, if you want to. Uh, in 03, uh, uh, we had uh, yeah, 12 months of total data, or like 11 months of uh, data taking. Uh, during that uh, third observing run, we detected uh, 74 gravitational wave uh, detections in total. And then actually about 24% of them required glitch mitigation. So that meant that uh, based on one in four signals usually had a glitch nearby. And that meant that we basically had to use base wave or like linear noise subtraction to try to model and remove the glitch. And then just because I think so, I'm running out of time, so I will not talk about these images, but this is just basically showing you the sensitivity range and uh, which detectors were turned on for how much time. Then talking about uh, 404. So uh, second, uh, the fourth observing run is planned to start in basically a week, like next Wednesday. Uh, and uh, what is, I think, so quite important, so here you can see at the right-hand side the plant sensitivities. And you can see, for example, that for LIGO detectors, we are planning to start from about 160 megaparsecs, and we finish with about 130 megaparsecs in O3. And that does not seem really much. Like, for example, if you divide by sensitivity, you basically see that there was about like 20% increase in sensitivity, which is not really that much when you think about that. But then you need to keep in mind that uh, basically 20% more sensitivity means that you have about uh, you basically that that is your like uh, range, but your actual volume volume observed volume goes to the cube of that. So because of that, like 20% more sensitivity means that you are basically getting almost like double more signals. So that means that there's a huge uh, influx of like additional detections. And in order to achieve this additional sensitivity, uh, there were multiple things that were changed. So we tried to increase uh, laser power. We also tried to remove uh, low noise uh, sources uh, that you saw uh, at lower frequencies. Then we also installed like new mirrors because there were some problems with the previous mirrors. And then we also added frequency dependence using, which is like a very complicated topic. I'm not really uh, expert in that as well myself. Uh, so there's a reference later on that. But yes, we basically made a lot of changes to the detectors to basically be able to have that 20% uh, increased sensitivity. And then I will leave you just with uh, data quality references. So about LIGO strain data, there's a couple of important and interesting papers uh, about strain data, sorry. And then about uh, LIGO data quality, there's like one of the papers uh, that talks a lot about the data quality itself in the second and third observing. So this is an excellent paper if you want to have a look in more detail what is happening with the detector. And then just a couple of other extra papers about what I talked previously, and for example, like frequency dependence reason. So, yes, so these are the papers, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ronaldas. Very nice talk. It was very, very clear. Uh, so in ask.eguin.org, um, there, um, there are many questions, there are, but there have been a lot of activities, to, thanks to all our mentors that have uh, replied to the questions, more or less. But maybe we have a few minutes, uh, it's worth um, discussing uh, some of these questions. So for example, one of uh, these uh, ask, 
what are the reasons behind these glitches? How trains and fridge connected to the main power creates glitches? Yeah, so <clears throat> let me go back to uh, these things. Yeah, for example, uh, slow scattering. So when the train is passing uh, by the detector, I, I never been to Livingston detector actually, but I know that there are uh, trains nearby the detector. So when the train is going by the detector, by the detector, it uh, shakes the ground. And because the ground is shaken, uh, the beam, uh, like the beam tube, like the laser itself is also shaken. And because of that, you basically get this uh, scattering, light scattering, uh, uh, that is uh, light that is scattering from the beam. And because of that, you basically get, the, get that extra light in the beam itself. And because of that, you basically get these glitches, which are shown right here. So slow, slow scattering and fast scattering is happening because of the light, because of that extra light. And that extra light is happening because there, there's that extra movement of mirrors. And these mirrors are moving because of the ground shaking because of the trains. So this is one of the examples of uh, how trains can affect, uh, how trains can create glitches and affect data quality. For fridges, uh, fridges are basically, uh, fridges, uh, like in Hanford detector, for example, like you can read basically explanation right here. You can go and have a look. But the idea is quite simple that basically fridges are like sometimes they are like, you know, turned on because they need to freeze and sometimes they're turning off. So accidentally that glitch, uh, that fridge was connected to basically the, uh, the electrical power that is using, that is basically connected to the uh, detector itself. And that meant, for example, when the fridge was powering up, there was also power taken from like the mains. Uh, and because of that, you could actually feel that electrical difference in, in, the, in the electrical systems that was used for the detector. And because of that, you could see glitches happening like every two hours, for example. So there are like multiple reasons how, how you can create glitches. And there's like thousands of glitch, uh, thousands of reasons, but these are just like a couple of examples. Yes. Thanks. So uh, maybe another uh, question, uh, even if it was already fairly discussed, uh, someone asking if there is a, a register of glitches in the public uh, data. Can I find glitches in the same way I could find, find events in the tutorials? Uh, yes, there is. So uh, for example, uh, if you would go to Gravity Spy database, uh, I do not have the link here, unfortunately. I should actually put that. So if you could put that uh, question on Ask Equin, I will reply to the correct link for that. Or basically, you can just use like search, like Google search, and just look at Gravity Spy database. And you would be able to find uh, glitches for uh, the all of the op open data. So for the first, second, and third observers, you can go and have a look at the Gravity Spy database and say, for example, that you want Tom T glitches or you want whistle glitches. And you can select like different, like you know, different times, different signal to noise ratios, and so on. So yes, yeah, so this is public. Uh, if you cannot find this link, uh, please just try to look. Uh, please uh, post your uh, question on the Ask Edwin, and I will reply to the link. Yeah, yes, it's it's on uh, on Ask Edwin. And uh, by the way, I think so. It's it's at Zenodo. Uh, link the one we are mentioning and uh, in the years these links always get updated so uh, we have um, everything until or three i think so there is a, a question in the in the last question in in the chat does earthquakes earthquakes or underground nuclear explosion cause noise in the data uh, was the question about earthquakes or nuclear explosions like don't remember could you repeat this question <laughs> does Earthquakes or underground nuclear explosions cause noise in the data? Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> earthquakes, definitely. And earthquakes uh, have is a huge problem. And even, for example, if there's an earthquake happening in Japan, for example, or like somewhere else in the world, we can feel it. And sometimes it's actually causing a lot of problems for us. So uh, earthquakes are like, well, that is basically when the ground is shaking quite a lot. And sometimes this is causing the lock loss. So for example, if I would go to this plot right here, like basically a lock loss means that uh, detectors are not observing anymore. And this happens because of the major incidences with the detector, well, not major, but basically something is bad happening with the detector. So for example, if there's an earthquake, the ground is moving and we are not able to keep the detector, the, the, the detector stable anymore. And because of that, we basically lose the interferometer. We basically just like, we are not observing anymore. So earthquakes are really a huge problem. 
Uh, I'm not really sure about nuclear explosions because I do not know if they are still happening. Well, I don't think so they're happening anymore, but I'm pretty sure if there would be a, a nuclear explosion, I think so we would be able to feel that with the detectors as well because like they are very good at detecting uh, seismic motions. So I think so we would be able to feel that, unfortunately. Yes, and uh, and uh, I don't know about LIGO, but about uh, since I'm Virgo part, I know that there was a paper about earthquakes, uh, trying to connecting our loss of lock with all the earthquakes in the, in the world. So there are studies about the impact of the earthquake, not so much on the noise, but as you said, for us it's another problem. We will we lose the lock, so it means then the parameter doesn't work anymore. Okay, so I think we can uh, um, thank our um, our speaker because it's uh, about time uh, to to go to the next um, topic. So the next uh, speaker, sorry, I'm I'm don't want to uh, modify my screen because I'm sharing, so I'm using my phone for other things. So um, our our next speaker is uh, Gustav. Uh, Chandra, that uh, will speak about gravitational wave searches for compact binary um, uh, mergers. And uh, Gustav is a PhD student at uh, IIT Bombay and is working on compact binary searches and parameter uh, estimation. Again, sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Agatha. Uh, it was correct, actually. <laughs> Anyways, uh... So I will, so this is a brief outline of my talk. So I will start by introducing, uh, give a bit introduction to gravitational wave sig signal analysis. And then I will tell you what does the signal actually look like. And then I will go forward and tell you about the different assumptions that you make for the data while trying to look for the signals. And then I will tell you one method using which you can try to look for gravitational wave signals. And finally, I will conclude by talking about the limitations of this type of signal searching method and tell you the different tools and tricks and techniques that you can use to look uh, overcome these limitations. So without any further delay, uh, let's jump right in. So as you might know, uh, among the several bold predictions the general relativity made, one of them was the existence of gravitational waves and they are colloquially referred to as the ripples in space time. They can be produced by any time varying non axisymmetric mass distribution, but whether they will be measurable or not is a different question. Now, current generation ground-based gravitational wave detectors, such as advanced LIGO or advanced Virgo, can observe high-frequency gravitational wave sources, that is sources which emit gravitational waves between, let's say, tens of hours to a few thousand hours. And this includes transient sources, such as compact binary mergers and supernova explosion, or continuous sources, such as those coming from a rotating neutron star, or let's say stochastic sources, such as cosmic fluctuations in the early universe. The focus in this workshop is gravitational wave signals from compact binary mergers. Now, speaking of compact binaries, they are binaries which are composed or consist of compact binary objects, which are any astrophysical objects whose radius is roughly proportional to their mass. This includes white dwarfs, uh, neutron star, and black holes. Now, current generation LIGO Virgo detectors observe binary black hole signals or binary neutron star signals or neutron star black hole binary signals. Provided the strain induced on the gravitational wave detectors is of the order of roughly 10 to a minus 21, which equates to the fact that the change in the length is of the order of 10 to a minus 18 meter. To give you an idea of the length scale that we are speaking of, uh, you can think something like this in this hierarchy. The size of an atom is roughly of the order of 10 to a minus 10 meter, which is roughly one angstrom. The size of a neutron is roughly of the order of 10 to a minus 15 meter, whereas the Length changes that we are trying to measure using our LIGO detectors is roughly of the order of 10 to minus 18 meters, which is three orders of magnitude less. If you are interested in the science case for these gravitational wave signals from these kind of compact binary mergers, uh, please join in tomorrow and look into the other slides. Okay, now that we know what kind of signals that we are looking for, it is trying to but it is actually helpful to understand what does the signal actually look like. Now, compact binary signals, in particular non-spinning binary black hole signal, consist of four different phases. We generally say it's composed of three different phases, but I will try to break it in four different phases. The first part consists of the adiabatic in spiral phase, during which the two black holes orbit around each other in a slowly but steadily decaying orbit. 
until and unless a sort of a climax is reached when the two black holes plunge into one another to form a highly excited black hole, which in due course of time links down to form a uh, to form a curved black hole, which is a black hole which is completely characterized by its component masses and its spin value. Now, binary black hole signals such as this are characterized by a set of 15 different parameters, which you can broadly categorize into a set of intrinsic parameters and a set of extrinsic parameters. The intrinsic parameters consist of quantities such as the component masses m1 and m2, and the two spin vectors chi1 and chi2, and they together determine the signal waveform morphology and its phase of emission. The extrinsic parameters consist of quantities such as the sky location of the source, which is given by the right ascension to the source and the declination of the source, the luminosity distance dl to the source or equivalent to the late shift to the source, the binary orientation parameters such as the inclination of the binary and the azimuth. So the inclination gives you how it is oriented with respect to you, whereas the azimuth gives you the orientation with respect to the x y plane. It also the extrinsic parameters also include the polarization angle psi and the merger time pc. Now, during one of your tutorials last day, I think tutorial number 1.4, uh, you already came to the realization that compact binary signals are pretty well modeled. And if you want to know more in details, you can check this reference out here. But the main point to note is that if you want to include more physics into your binary black hole signals, you need to incorporate more parameters. So for example, binary neutrons signals has two additional intrinsic parameters, which are called as tidal deformation parameters, which measure how squishy squashy your neutron stars are. Because neutron stars, after all, are not really rigid objects. Similarly, if you relax your assumption of quasi-spherical binary black hole signal, then you will need two more parameters to tell how eccentric your binary black hole signal is, or how eccentric your binary black hole is. Now, uh, during your tutorials in 1.4, you also tested out how varying different intrinsic parameters affects your waveform morphology. And I will just go ahead and repeat them one by one. And I will just repeat for the cases of intrinsic parameters and I will leave it to you to figure out how the extrinsic parameters affects a binary black hole signal. To start, uh, let us look into the effect of total mass. By the way, uh, whatever mass parameters that we measure or we try to estimate from that of your gravitational wave signals, are red shifted or detector frame total mass. So what does it mean is that the gravitational wave signal is actually propagating through an expanding universe. And as a result of that, the gravitational wave signals undergoes a red shift. So instead of measuring the total mass MT, which is just the sum of the component masses M1 and M2, you measure the detector frame total mass, which is one plus Z factor one, which is MT into one plus Z. Having said that, if you fix the binary parameters, uh, all the other binary parameters, and just change the total mass of the binary, you can see that the heavier binary emits a larger amplitude. And this is pretty much apparent out here. Similarly, if you change the mass ratio of the system, which gives you a measure of how asymmetric the binary is, then you will see that the more symmetric binary emits a larger signal amplitude. By the way, uh, the mass ratio is defined as the mass of the heavier black hole relative to that of the lighter black hole. And this is always greater than equals to one. The spins also affect the binary signal morphology. And in order to understand them, I have tried to compare that against the non-spinning black hole binaries. So let's start with the assumption that the black hole spins are aligned with respect to one another and also with respect to the orbital angular momentum. In that case, the black holes can actually inspire to much closer separation. And as you can see out here, you will have longer, stronger gravitational wave signals. If on the other hand, the black hole spins are anti-aligned with respect to the orbital angular momentum, then the black holes won't be able to inspire to such closer separation, and therefore you will have sort of weaker gravitational wave signals. If however, the black hole spins are misaligned or randomly oriented with respect to that of the orbital angular momentum, then the binary motion won't be constrained to a plane. So you won't have a quasi-circular orbit because it won't be constrained to a plane, but it will be rather a quasi-spherical orbit because the binary plane will itself be precessing about the direction of the total angular momentum. And because of that, you will see a modulating amplitude as well as a modulating phase. If you want to get a much more visual picture, do check this link where there are numerical simulations trying to show you or trying to visualize all these different spin effects. Okay, now that we have a basic idea about how the signal looks like, it is better to understand what does the data look like. And Ronaldus has already told you about much of the content that I'm actually going to cover. So first of all, uh, gravitational wave detector data is digitized. 
which means each and every second of data contains 16,384 samples. The data that is available in the public space is contains sampling at both 16 kilohertz as well as 4 kilohertz. Now, the fundamental assumption behind almost all compact binary analysis that we perform is a linear assumption of the data. We always assume that our detected data consists of two additive conditions, such as the signal strain S and the noise N. The signal strain, at least for our that will Ah, okay, now I can hear you again. Well, Go on. Okay. okay, okay, now it's fine. Okay. Uh, so th as I was saying, the noise is a random variable, and that means you cannot uniquely predict the value of noise at each and every instant of time. But rather, there are uh, quantities that are from an underlying noise distribution. And furthermore, as Ronald has told you, the gravitational wave detector noise contains contribution from a multitude of different noise sources, each of which is, is a sample from an underlying noise distribution, which can be quite a bit different from one another. And furthermore, this noise amplitude is quite a bit louder than the signal amplitude that we are trying to find. And therefore, we have a kind of a needle in a haystack problem. The goal for today and tomorrow is going to be to find a template or model waveform, let's say is theta prime, which adequately represents the signal strain S of theta, such that the residual, which is the data minus the model waveform, follows the underlying noise distribution. So what is our assumption of our gravitational wave data when you are trying to perform a gravitational wave signal analysis? When we assume that the detected data follows a zero mean Weissen stationary multivariate Gaussian distribution. Well, that's a mouthful of words, so I will try to break it down into simpler chunks. So what does white sense stationary mean? It means that the elements of the noise correlation matrix does not really depend at which instant of time your noise is taking place, but it rather depends on the time lag between the samples. Or in other words, in a much more simpler language, it is stationary or it is time translation invariant. It means that if you perform a Fourier, if you try to look into this noise correlation matrix in the Fourier domain, then the noise correlation matrix is going to be diagonal with the diagonal entries being proportional to the noise power spectrum, which as Ronald has told you, and even during your tutorial in 1.3, you figured out that the noise power spectrum gives you a measure of the amount of noise power that is present at a given frequency. And you can estimate it using a variety of techniques, one of which is the Welch method. So we are looking into the noise power spectrum, we can figure out how sensitive our gravitational wave detector is. So here is a plot showing the noise power spectral density of the Hanford, Livingston, and the Virgo detector. And just by looking into it and how shallow it is, you can pretty much understand that the Virgo detector is the least sensitive of all the three detectors. Whereas the Livingston detector outperforms the Hanford detector, especially at lower frequencies. So what does zero mean means? It means that if you take the noise, noise samples and you average it over time, you will find that the mean value of the noise is equals to zero. And this is what you exactly saw during your tutorials. You found that the noise is rapidly oscillating somewhat like this about the mean value of zero. And if you average it over that time quantity, you'll find that it actually comes out to be zero because it's random, rapidly oscillating. And what but what does multivariate Gaussian distribution mean? It means they are samples from this kind of probability distribution. The proportion constant is something which you can figure it out uh, by just integrating this to unity. If you have a gravitational wave signal present in your data, then it will just adjust the mean value of the noise. Okay, now that we have a model of the signal and you have a model of the data, let us try to understand and uh, find a gravitational wave signals. Now, right at the outset, I, I will say that there are different ways within using which you can find a gravitational wave signal. And I'm just going to focus on a technique which is called as match filtering. And I've tried to break it down into four different stages in order to ensure that it is easy to grasp. So the first step is what is called as whitening the detected data. So we take the detected data, we Fourier transform it, and we re-weigh or normalize it with the amplitude. Can you try again? Uh, am I audible? Okay, okay, now it's better. Go okay. on. Uh, is it okay if I switch off the uh, camera? 
it, I think it can save the bandwidth a bit. Yes, yes, it's a good idea. Okay, good. Okay, so one way to find a gravitational wave signal is via match filtering. And that actually uses the fact that uh, there are multiple steps that are involved in finding uh, a gravitational wave signals in using match filtering. And I've tried to break it down into four different stages. The first stage is what we call as whitening the detector data. So we take the detector data D and we Fourier transform it into the frequency domain. And then we try to reweigh it using the noise power spectrum. And this actually ensures that if there are any excess noise power at any frequency, then it becomes much more obvious. And this is exactly what you see out here. So there is an excess amount of noise power at this frequency and this at this instant of time. And this becomes much more prominent as we normalize the whitening data. Similarly, we also whiten the template waveform. And this actually helps to adjust the template's amplitude at each and every frequency to that of the detector's noise level. The third step includes or or involves trying to find the predicted signal to noise ratio or what we call as the optimal signal to noise ratio of the template. Uh, by the way, the signal to noise ratio is a measure of the strength of the signal relative to that of the noise in which it is sitting. And we can find this by cross correlating the whitened template with itself. Now, since cross correlating in time domain equates to multiplication in frequency domain, this is the quantity that you end up calculating. And in the fourth step, what you do is you cross correlate the whitened detected data with that of the whitened normalized template. And then you try to measure how strong it is relative to that of the optimal listener of the template. And that's exactly what you do in the process of match filtering. Now, you might be wondering that, uh, okay, first of all, I really don't know where in the data our gravitational wave signal is sitting. So how can I really find out the signal in the first place? Well, what you can do is like you can match filter as a function of time, and then you can find the peak in the signal to noise ratio distribution or signal to noise ratio time series. And that will give you exactly the time instant at which the signal enters the detector data. Now, you also might be wondering that I really don't know the binary parameters that I'm trying to look for the signal, the binary parameters that determine the gravitational wave signal. So how am I really going to look for the signal? Well, uh, you can create what we call as a template bank, which is basically a large number of waveforms that is parameterized by the binary parameters. And you can numerically maximize the gravitational wave detected data with each and every combination of this uh, template waveform. Now, since match filtering is very sensitive to the signal's phase evolution, there will be one template and only one template that will maximize the signal to noise ratio. And we call this template as a base mass template. Now, as you might have realized by now, uh, this will actually involve searching over a 14 dimensional uh, parameter space. And this is really a computationally expensive process. So what we do uh, during searching is that we assume that the signal is adequately differentiated by the quasi-circular non-precessing uh, quadrupole modes. So what it means is that we assume that the gravitational signal can be well represented by just the dominant modes of a gravitational wave signal. And by doing this, you can absorb the extrinsic parameters of the binary in terms of an overall amplitude term and an overall phase term over which you can analytically maximize over. And therefore, just constructing a template band, which is parameterized by thus the component masses M1 and M2, and the aligned component of the black hole spin is sufficient. If you want to know more about this technique, you can take a look at this paper uh, by Satya and Durandar. Uh, now, it must be uh, emphasized that match filtering operation is really optimal if the detected data is Gaussian. As, and as Ronald has told you, uh, gravitational wave detector is hardly Gaussian. Leave alone that it's not even stationary. It, and this is simply because of gravitational wave detector data is plagued with intermittent non-Gaussian transients or glitches, which can not only raise false alarm, but it also hampers or reduces the search performance. So here is some more uh, glitches that is present in the gravitational wave detector data. And as uh, Ronald has told you, that we do understand some of these glitches. For example, we understand why this air compressor glitch is there, but we have no understanding why the bleep glitch is there or why the tomtic glitch is occurring and so on and so forth. So in order to deal with these non-ideal noise properties, we use a combination of vetoes, gating, coincidences, and signal noise distribution to penalize or remove noise glitches. Now, at this point of time, it is important to mention that we have four different types of searches four different types of templated searches. 
namely the PyCVC search, the GST level search, MBTA search, and the Spire search. And each one of them has their own uh, bag of tools and tricks and techniques to deal with the non-ideal properties of Mars. Now, it is being, it will take a lot of time to actually cover each and every one of these different techniques. So just focus on a handful of them. So let's try to focus on the technique which we call as gating. So what this process involves is like you take your detector data and then you whiten the detector data and try to look for large deviation from that of your Gaussian distribution. So this plot out here just shows that there is a glitch sitting in the detector data, which causes a hundred sigma deviation from that of your uh, from that of your Gaussian distribution. So what we do is that we apply a universe QQ window, which sort of looks like this, and we just remove or window out that portion of the data. Now, instead of doing uh, this using the whitened detector data stream, you can also use a machine learning based algorithm and look into the auxiliary data channels. Now, you might have heard that the gravitational wave detector data consists of 400,000 channels, each of which is trying to monitor some portion of the detector. And there is just one channel that tries to look for the gravitational wave signal or that records the gravitational wave signal. So you can use this extra bit of information that is present in this auxiliary channel to clean the detector data and also to identify the glitch in the first place. Now, I think the most important uh, test that you can actually perform is called as the coincident test. And that actually excites or remove a large number of noise triggers. Now, it should be kept in mind that almost all of the noises that occurs in the detector or almost uh, all of the detector noise that are occurring in individual detectors are of local origin. That is, the noises in the detectors are uncorrelated across the detector network. So if you have an astrophysical trigger, you can demand that this gravitational wave signal will be observed across the detector network within physically allowed time delays. So for example, if you have a gravitational wave signal that you observe in the handford detector, then you expect to observe it in the Livingston detector within a time delay of 10 milliseconds. Similarly, if you have a gravitational wave signal that you observe in the Hanford detector, then you must have observed this gravitational wave signal in the Virgo detector either 25 milliseconds before the before uh, what when you observe in Hanford or 25 milliseconds after the trigger. And other than this time delay constraint, we also impose a template-based constraint wherein we say that the signal must be described by the same base mass template. That is the template that maximizes the signal to noise ratio in the handful detector must be the same template that maximizes the signal to noise ratio in the living stem detector. Okay, now all these ways, actually, uh, the coincident is actually focus in using the data from different detectors. But even at the single detector level, we also perform a multitude of different noise discrimination techniques. One of these, and uh, this is probably the most popular one, is called as the reduced chi square test. And this uh, uh, test actually tries to check whether the morphology of the signal trigger is consistent with that of your best mass template. What we do during this process, and this is what you will do even during in your tutorials, is like you will try to divide the template into a number of small frequency bins. And then you will try to measure the amount of signal to noise ratio, or rather the square of the signal to noise ratio, in each one of these frequency bin, and you will try to see how much it deviates from that of the expected noise power distribution or expected signal to noise ratio distribution. If you find that the reduced chi square value is close to unity, then the trigger is well represented or well uh, adequately represented by that of your base mass template. If it is otherwise, then the reduced chi square value will first uh, shifted away from unity, and this can actually occur if you have a glitch present in the detector data. What we do with this reduced chi square test is that we try to amend our signal to noise ratio in such a way that we try to separate the noise distribution from that of our signal distribution. Other than this reduced chi square test, we also perform a test what is called as autocorrelation test. And this actually uses uh, the fact that we have a predicted signal to noise ratio distribution, which you can get from that of your template. So when you cross correlate the template with itself, you get your predicted signal to noise ratio distribution. And you can try to compare with what is the measured signal to noise ratio uh, function or how the measured signal to noise ratio varies as a function of time. By comparing these two quantities, you can construct a quanti uh, again a quantity similar to that of the reduced chi square test, and you can use it to amend your signal to noise ratio. Now, as a final stage, uh, what during performing a search, what we do is we try to assign a statistical significance to a candidate event. 
and this uh, is how much how many signal mass uh, the signal trigger is actually away from that of your noise distribution this is what exactly we are trying to measure and there are again a um, number of steps and this is again not being done by all the searches uh, some of the searches use a completely different method for example a gsp search but this is what you are going to do during your tutorial so the first step involves calculating what we is called as the rank or the score of a gravitational wave trigger and one of the ways you can calculate this rank or score of an event is best by square summing the uh, the amended signal to noise ratio this is what is called as the quadrature sum statistic next you try to simulate or generate your background triggers by the method of time slice what we do is like we take one of the detector data let's say handful and we shift the detector data with respect to the livingston detector by an unphysical time delay so let's say you have a gra uh, let's say yeah, that light travel time between handful and livingston detector is 10 milliseconds so if you shift the detector of handful data with respect to livingston data by let's say a uh, 1 second or let's say 2 minutes or 10 minutes of an hour and look for coincidences then all coincidences that you will see is of accidental or noise origin and this is how you construct your background triggers now once you've constructed your background triggers you again try to rank them using this quadrature sum statistic and then you try to estimate what we call as the false alarm rate the false alarm rate is the number of false positive that you will observe within a uh, within a uh, background time tv so so just to give an idea what false alarm rate is so let's imagine that you have a false alarm rate of 1 in 100 years what it actually means that if you observe for hundreds of years there will be one noise trigger that might look like the gravitational wave signal that you have observed so if you have a lower value of false alarm rate that means your candidate event is much more statistically significant just to give you another example let's say if you have a false alarm rate uh, for an event to be 1 in 1 year that is quite a bit bad as compared to an event with a false alarm rate of in 1 in 100 years you can associate the or you can convert this false alarm rate into a false alarm probability by using this formula and this uh, plot out here shows you the false alarm rate as a function of the ranking statistic all these gray circles that you see here is the background noise figures that you have generated using that method of time slice and the and the blue purple uh, sorry for this circle it's actually i increased the size of the image and that's why it moved uh, this this blue triangle that you can see out here corresponds to that of the GW 1905-21. Now, up until now, whatever searches I have talked about actually assumes that the gravitational field signal that we are trying to detect is well modeled. And as I said, match filtering is really, really sensitive to the signal's phase evolution. Now, it might so happen that in a gravitational wave detected data, it, it may contain a gravitational wave signal from that, let's say, a supernova explosion. Then does that mean that we will miss out that signal if you are trying to match filter using compact binary signals? And the answer is actually yes, you will miss out that gravitational wave signal. So as an alternative, we perform non-templated search, or we also perform weekly model searches. The first search technique that is uh, that we popularly use is called as the coherent web bus search. And there's any, again another search which is called as the OLIP search. And these searches assume that if you have an astrophysical transient, then that astrophysical transient is going to be short lived. And this gravitational wave signal will create some localized excess in the time frequency map coherently across the detector network. So if you identify any such excess in energy coherently across the detector network, then it is a strong indication that that trigger is of astrophysical origin. Now, instead of using gravitational wave waveforms models, uh, which are um, uh, which are actually modified or which are actually using the information of general relativity. You can also try to model gravitational wave signals using a sign, sum of sine Gaussian waveforms or Morigaba wavelets. Morigaba wavelets are basically a special case of sine Gaussian waveforms. And if you're interested in much more details, you can take a look at this paper. So, just to conclude, uh, gravitational wave signals from compact binary mergers are pretty well modeled. And uh, there are many different ways of finding these signals, one of which is the match filtering, match filter statistic, which is extremely sensitive to the signal phase evolution and is optimal only when the detector data is Gaussian. Unfortunately, this is not really the case. And therefore, we use different sort of tricks and techniques to account for the non gaussianities in the detector data. And we also use non templated searches to search for the signals that are unexpected. And as we speak, and as we uh, 
move ahead in time, we also need to improve our signal analysis techniques as the detectors continues to improve. Because as we improve our detector sensitivity, there will be more and more noises that we might not have seen before. So with this, I will pause and I will be happy to take questions. Thanks, uh, thanks Gustav for this uh, very nice uh, and comprehensive uh, um talk uh, again also in this case there was uh, some activity um on ask.tiguin.org but uh, i saw also uh, one question in the chat so maybe we can start from from there so the question uh, um, we got is uh, do all black holes spin can all this uh, compact binary mergers consist in of um, care black holes Yes, astrophysically speaking, it is yes. So if you have a, uh, let's say a stellar object, which is collapsing, and if that initial stellar object has some spin, then the formed contact object, let's say a white dwarf or a black hole or a neutron star will have spin that is associated with you. Okay. And then I just saw another uh, question on ask.tiguin.org. Uh, what is the significance of the FAR, uh, the false alarm rate? Considering we will check uh, whether it is a detection anyway, how does calculating the probability help? Okay, so the false alarm rate uh, gives you an idea of the statistical significance of an event. So if I say that the false alarm rate of an event is 1 in 100 years, it means that, this, that if I analyze the detector data for hundreds of years, then there will be a chance of one noise event that is occurring, which has a statistical or uh, which has a rank or score similar to that of your program trigger. So that was false alarm rate means. Or if you want, in terms of a much more easier uh, to understand statistic, you can see that the false alarm rate is the number of false positives that you observe in your gravity sample detector data. Okay. Uh, so another uh, question that was uh, asked is, uh, since the noise in uh, gravitational wave data is not Gaussian, what are the alternative to Gaussian assumptions to model to noise, to model the noise? Yeah, when you are trying to look for gravitational wave signals or even when trying to perform parameter estimation, we have to assume this uh, thing that the gravitational wave detector data is Gaussian. Unfortunately, it is not the case, and therefore we use different kinds of tricks and techniques. And as Ronald has talked about, we also try to remove, uh, we try to model the noise in the detector data, and we try to remove it from that of the data, such that the data actually follows a Gaussian distribution. So this is an assumption that we are making. So then I see another question. Can we think of massive binary st star system, not compact, theoretically as sources of gravitational wave? Yeah, they can actually, as I said, like any time very non symmetric uh, mass distribution can produce gravitational wave. Even if you rotate your arms in a non symmetric way, then it can also produce gravitational wave. Whether they will be measurable or not is a different question. So current generation detectors such as advanced LIGO and advanced VARGO cannot detect gravitational waves coming from white dwarfs. But when you will have future detectors such as NIXA, they will be capable of observing even gravitational waves from that of uh, white dwarf binaries within our current galaxy. Okay. So, so I see another question, but I don't understand it because he's asking, can you talk more about the limitation of it? But uh, when you write on ask.tigun.org, please be more specific because now of it, I don't know what it means. So, okay, maybe rewrite it better so that mentors can reply you later. Okay, so um, ah, I see another uh, another question. Why does rotation have to be non-asymmetric for emission of gravitational waves? Ah, okay. So you can understand it as follows. So if you have, uh, if you look into the mass term, that mass term is actually conserved. I mean, by mass, I mean the total mass and the energy. If you look into momentum, the momentum of a binary system is also conserved. Uh, to the leading order, I'm talking uh, completely in the new, uh, le uh, leading order. So if you look in also into the orbital angular momentum, that is also conserved to the leading order. 
Now the mass uh, term actually corresponds to the monopole moment. If you look into the momentum term, that actually corresponds to the dipole moment. And if you look into the uh, the orbital angular momentum conservation, that actually corresponds to the current dipole term moment. So the leading order contribution come from variations of the quadrupole moment, and that quadrupole moment is actually a measure of how non-axis symmetry your binary use. Hence, the dominant contribution comes from non-axis symmetry values. Yes. Yeah, you can think it's it also in some kind of uh, if you think of uh, electromagnetic way, you need uh, uh, the dipole for gravitational way. You need the quadrupole, but it's uh, the, the, because the previous momentum are conserved basically. Okay, so I think uh, it's uh, we have spoken uh, spoke a lot about this. I don't think there are other questions. So I think we should thank again our speaker, our speakers of today. Thanks a lot, both of you. And uh, I I will leave the word to the floor to Simone, who will um, uh, make uh, us do a tour of the tutorials of today. Go on. So thank you, Agatha. Thanks to all the speakers. Uh, so I'm going to uh, screen share. So actually, you should be able to see now the gravitational wave open data center page. So let's go to the tutorials as we did yesterday. You would need to go to tutorials, then workshops. Then you need to click on the gravitational wave sixth open data workshop. And then you go on run the tutorials. So today we are going to check uh, tutorials of day two, which are a little bit more involved with respect Wait, to what Simona, we Simona, sorry. sorry? Uh, we yeah. see the open data workshop uh, page still. It, it didn't, oh. didn't change. So maybe you, you should stop sharing a reshare again because it, it was blocked. Yeah, apology, let me try. Um, okay, can you see it now? Yes. Okay. So I started again, sorry. So from this tab, which is the Gravitational Wave Open Data Workshop, you need to click on Run Tutorials, and this will lead you to the usual GitHub on which you worked yesterday. So let's go to Tutorials. Let's check day number two. And you see that today we just have three tutorials, but don't be too confident because today tutorials are a little bit more involved with respect to what you've seen yesterday. So we have three tutorials that basically are going to explain you how to look for uh, gravitational signals in our data using match filtering and how to say how much they are significant. So let's start with the tutorial uh, 2.1. Of course, I'm, I'm not going uh, uh, through the entire tutorial since uh, you will do it with your mentors during the study apps, but I will uh, give you a uh, overall, let's say, view of the tutorials that we are going to see today. So the first tutorial is about uh, uh, an easy introduction to uh, an easy application of match filtering. So just a reminder, if you're running the tutorials on Google Colab, please do remember to uncomment this line, otherwise you won't have the packages. Then the first tutorial is gonna be about uh, uh, basically apply the match filtering. So the first thing that you will do is to um, generate some Gaussian distributed data using this, uh, this Python code. Then you will inject a gravitational wave signal inside it. Here you can recognize in these two cells the commands that you learned yesterday from tutorial 1.4. Then you are going to inject in your data basically a signal um, composed by just the plus polarization. This is the signal that we are going to inject. And this is the data where we are going to inject it. So you can already see that uh, by, plot, by overplotting the noise and the signal that you're going to inject, that this time the signal that you're looking at is not really you know, visible inside our data, but it is really hidden underneath uh, the noise level. So the basic idea now is that uh, we will uh, use a template. A template, uh, as our speakers uh, said, is nonetheless than a waveform, so a possible you know, signal that you are looking inside our data, and we are going to slice it onto our data stream to check if uh, at some point it overlaps with the signal. 
And when it does, uh, we expect uh, uh, to find a cross correlation, which is higher than the normal. So you will do this. You will basically take your template, slide it onto your data, and basically you can see that the value of the cross correlation when the template does not overlap with the signal is basically, you know, very low. And uh, it oscillates according to a distribution that you will need to discuss in the exercise. And when it matches, you will find a peak. So this peak is basically the time in, at which the template and the signal perfectly overlaps and can tell you when the signal is basically arrived in the detector. But of course, reality is a little more complicated because our noise is not, you know, uh, perfectly Gaussian. It is colored Gaussian noise, which means that different frequency components, they have different level of noise. So here you will learn how to generate this kind of noise, uh, drawing from a power spectral density. Uh, you have seen yesterday what a power spectral density is. Uh, and then you will inject uh, uh, a signal inside this, this noise, noise generated from this uh, colored, uh, colored uh, noise process. And uh, you will apply again the cross correlation technique to see where the signal is. Then there are a few challenges uh, in which you will be asked uh, uh, to basically study what's the distribution of the uh, cross correlation when you do not match the signal and uh, how to say how much significant is this point. Tutorial number, number two is going to be on, at this, on the same line of tutorial uh, uh, 2.1. The only difference here is that uh, we will work more with, uh, let's say, real gravitational wave data. So you will basically download uh, a, a data strain containing uh, our first gravitational wave detection, GW150914, and you will be asked it to analyze it with the matcher filtering technique. So for instance, this is the strain uh, for GW150914. Uh, note that here we already applied some high pass filtering to remove the low frequency components in order to not see the noise. So, you know, there is already some level of processing that you will need to do. And then you will need to look for your signal. Uh, so you will define your template here. Uh, I mean, we are already telling you that this was a signal compatible with a binary black hole merger of two black holes around the 36 solar masses. And then you will ask, uh, you, I mean, this is basically your template. And then you will be asked to slice this template onto your data and calculate the signal-to-noise ratio. Now, this is a little bit more different with respect to the cross-correlation before, because now we have a definition of the scalar product as Gustav introduced to us. It's basically the um, integral of the Fourier components of the signal and the data normalized by the power spectral density. And this will give you the signal-to-noise ratio, which is basically how much your signal is stronger with respect to the noise level. So a signal-to-noise ratio of 20, for instance, which is the one that you will find for this signal, typically says that your signal is 20 times stronger with respect to the typical noise fluctuation in your detector. So here you can see that, uh, again, we can compute this signal-to-noise ratio as a function of the time at which we are slicing our template onto our data. And there is a clear peak, which is where we can find the GW150914. So uh, now you can try to see uh, how the template looks like with respect to your data. So you can see that, uh, I mean, this is, a, this is a very nice comparison because the blue line is real data while the orange line is uh, the template. So they match very well. The only fact here, which you need to be very careful is that uh, the data that you're looking at here is not, uh, of course, the original data that you can see here, here, this one, but it is whitened. Whitened means that basically we took a middle step, which is take the data, normalize it by the noise floor, which means that we divide it by, by the power spectral density so that uh, all the noise has the same, let's say, um, has the same level of application to the data. So it, it basically contaminates the data at the same level. 
And when you, when you, this process is usually called the whitening because you, you basically make all the noise equal because you divide out the, the frequency components. And when you, do the, when you do this, you will be able to see the signal, the blue one very well, even by eye, you don't need a template to do it. And you can also check that, you know, the signal is, uh, you can see it with the Q transform. And then if you subtract the template from the data, basically the signal disappears. So this is just, you know, showing you that the first check that we do is that when we find a signal, we can subtract it from the data and the residual of your data should be consistent with the uh, uh, Gaussian noise. So to conclude the speaking about the challenge on this notebook, uh, you will need to download some data that we prepare for you. So please remember to run this cell and you will be asked in the challenge to find, for instance, some signals hidden inside these data strains and uh, basically to compute for them the signal to noise ratio. So since we are running out of time, let's go to the last tutorial, tutorial 2.3. Uh, this is about estimating the, um, the, the significance of a gravitational wave candidate. So we will still use all the match filtering techniques that we learned in the previous tutorials, but now we will see more in details how to say how much significant is a gravitational wave candidate. So also here, we download uh, uh, data around uh, GW170814, which is the first triple gravitational wave detection from uh, M for the Livingston and Virgo. We calculate the power spectral density, and then we calculate the signal to noise ratio of the gravitational wave template that again, we provide it for you uh, for Enford, Livingston and Virgo. You can see that uh, in Enford and Livingston, we can see a clear peak in the SNR where the signal is present. While for Virgo, we see nothing, mostly because this was a signal uh, with a very low SNR in Virgo. So you cannot distinguish it uh, you know, very easily by eye. You can see that, for instance, there is a small peak here, but uh, it's not easy to say, you know, just by looking at this plot, uh, if this is a noise fluctuation, or if it is really the signal. So to understand the significance, uh, we will basically uh, apply this key square veto, which was explained by during during the during the talks. And this key square veto will show you basically when a signal is present in our detector. When the key square, uh, this is a normalized key square. So when it rapidly approaches one, it means that basically uh, you are looking at uh, um, you are looking at the signals. So here in M for the Livingston, you can see that there is a clear, you know, valley, which is basically when the signal is detected. While in Virgo, uh, unfortunately, this valley is not very, you know, alone is not very significant. So. Um, Okay, after that, we are going to see uh, how to assess the significance. So our first check is to see if the triggers of the signal, they fall all in a time window, which is given by the travel time of the signals between the detector. So uh, you have seen during the slides that the travel time is about a order of 10 milliseconds between several detectors. So it means that the triggers of all the signals must, must fall in, you know, this window, which is of the order of 10 milliseconds. And this is a first consistency check that you can do. The second consistency, consistency check is to look at the uh, distribution of the uh, basically SNR when uh, you don't have a trigger. So the basic idea is that here you make an histogram of all the value of the SNR fluctuations that you take here, that you observe here. So basically outside the area where you believe your signal is, you make an histogram and then you check where your peak in SNR, this one of the signal is falling. If it is falling very far on the tail of this distribution, then this is a confident detection. So this will basically give you an idea on how we uh, calculate the significance of our, of our signals. Then the challenge here is going to be on the same line of the tutorial 2.2. You will need to download a data strain and basically study the significance of your gravitational wave detection in it. Uh, just a reminder, uh, after that you have solved the challenge, go on Thinkific. So here, 
and answer the questions. So here I will just answer a random one. Maybe I will not, because otherwise you will know what's wrong and what is not, and it's going to be easier. But uh, uh, just a reminder, uh, a code that will appear suggesting some steps to do. For these notebooks, uh, in order for the code to work, you will need to run all the notebook before. So just remember, run all the notebook, and then just in case, copy and paste the code that will appear here. And I think this is all for today. So if you have any questions, uh, I don't know if there are any questions on the ASCII win. Um, sorry, I didn't, uh, I don't have the, um, the channel open, but in any case, uh, just as a reminder, uh, we ask you, if you have question on the tutorial, I sent you yesterday the, um, the 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 link uh, to ask question the tutorial of day two which is um uh, which is uh, this link and i see already uh, a question about the um, the waveform but uh, i remind you that um, so i will post in the in the chat uh, the link where you can post the question about the tutorial of the first day. And there is a question about how to build the template uh, and you should already know the answer because you there was a, a specific tutorial about how to build the template yesterday. So yes. have yeah, a look at the tutorial of yesterday and you will know the, your answer. Yes, short answer, there is a function called get FD waveform and get TD waveform from PyCBC, but you will find it in the tutorial. Yes. And uh, okay, so I guess uh, that's all. Another thing from my side, uh, please all that are hosting uh, study hub, remember to take um, pictures so we can make, make a nice collage at the end. And uh, I send you a link with the spreadsheet to note how many people are in each study hub just for us for to make some statistics to understand uh, which is the in-person um, uh, participation and i think uh, uh, that's it um, i don't know if the other um, organizer want to add something so thanks everyone so i just wanted to uh, reiterate that if you don't have a in-person study hub to attend and uh, you're welcome to join us online so we will again start in around half an hour um so yeah that's more or less it so if that's fine i'll just go offline now okay so bye everybody have fun with your study hub and thanks again to all the speaker and all the mentors for all the help bye okay. bye bye see you tomorrow bye see you tomorrow